and it says that we're live already. And awesome. We'll double check if that's actually true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we are, we are. So amazing. I am like everyone knows here already. I am so excited for this training with Jeremy. A couple of weeks ago, we were live with Jeremy on Instagram and we spoke about like sequencing and queuing techniques. But today, Jeremy, you're going to be speaking to us about how to find your voice or really develop your voice looking at your astrology chart. I'm super excited about this because I think it will give you so many great insights into your personality and how you can uh, use your personality to really um, embody your own voice, your own expression in your classes. For those that aren't familiar with you yet, Jeremy, can you explain a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes. So I, Jeremy Devins, I host the Quiet Mind Astrology podcast every week. I also have two other podcasts that are specifically yoga related. So my teacher taught me yoga, Ayurveda and Vedic astrology all together. So I learned all of that together many years ago, and I like to teach all of that. So I do I have three different podcasts. And the main one we'll be talking today is more about the astrology stuff. So that's Quiet Mind Astrology podcast. You can find that wherever you find podcasts. And I've been uh, doing this kind of health and wellness work for about 19 years now and astrology is for 17 years. And I uh, work with people. I do readings. I do a mentorship program and I will have a little presentation thing to share with like some links and some ways you can, we can like, uh, start applying this right away. So I'll get into that in a second, but yeah, that's who I am. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amazing. I've been following you for the last few years. I absolutely love your podcast and your way of explaining things. I think it's so structured and super clear for people that even when astrology seems very overwhelming or like, oh my God, there's so much to actually learn or know and um, well, find out about this, you make it very approachable, very easy to understand. And I think with a topic like astrology, that's very important because there is a lot of this in it. Yeah, it can go very deep and a lot of people will just look at the more superficial superficial stuff of like, oh, I have a son in Aries and it means this, and you have a son in Gemini, it means that. And it's it's kind of strange because it's so superficial and that's only a small fraction of your whole birth chart. And if you follow Western astrology, it's not even where the sun was when you were born, if you know the astronomy. And that's what Vedic astrology follows is much more like astronomy. So when if you say you have your birth chart and it says sun is in Pisces, it's very likely your sun is in Aquarius. And you might feel like, well, I'm such a Pisces. That's so not true. Well, then there's thousands of other factors in your chart that that's not the sun is not the center of everything in your chart. So uh, it can go very deep. Uh, and some people kind of approach it from a more superficial approach. I try to find the middle ground and like make it very approachable, very easy to learn and step by step. But uh, also give that depth and not just like the sort of sugar-coated or mm -hmm. inaccurate version of astrology that a lot of people follow. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I learned from you the difference really between what we learn in the West, like Western astrology and Ved Ved Vedic, Vedic astrology. Can you quickly explain these differences for those that don't know? Yeah, the quick version is that there's a source text of yoga, Ayurveda, Vedic astrology. So much of like the modern philosophy and spirituality comes from this source text of the Vedas. And Veda means wisdom or knowing or knowledge. It's where we get the word video, video to see, and vidya, knowledge. In uh, yoga teachings, we learn that. So the Vedas are this source text from around 1700s BCE. And they talk about the planets, they talk about yoga, they talk about Ayurveda, and so much more of the spiritual philosophy is in there. And in that tradition, people started to look up at the sky because you can imagine thousands of years ago when there's no light pollution. And if you can go out, I actually got to go out a few weeks ago and up into uh, middle of California and there's just clear skies and you can see everything so clearly. It's really amazing. 
And just imagine you would see that every day, thousands of years ago. So it's very easy to follow things and track things and, and watch these movements of the planets and stars. So that tradition got passed down from generation to generation. And uh, they started to notice things that take hundreds of years to really notice, like the procession of the equinoxes mm -hmm. in ancient India. They noticed that because they're passing it down generation to generation. And uh, that was not in the Western tradition from ancient Greece. And, and that civilization kind of crumbled. And the, I think part of that whole lineage was dropped of like being able to track that. Because 2000 years ago, ancient Babylonian astrology was accurate to the stars. So if they say your sun is in Pisces, that's where it was 2000 years ago. But it's mm -hmm. not anymore because of the procession of the equinoxes. So that's like the really short version of the differences. I have podcasts about that that go deeper. Like there's one called the um, the biggest mistakes people make with astrology. That's a good one to go to. Uh, just like these big differences between the two. Yeah, amazing. Thank you for explaining. I think that clears up things a little bit. <laughs> um, for the session today, do people need anything? Would it be? Yeah know what your chart really is already <laughs> yes if you uh if you happen to know your vedic chart great if you don't you can go to my website and unfortunately right now the server died because i just had a big oh. uh, i had a big program the other day over 300 people joined and like the server crashed of like to be able to get your chart it might be working now when you listen to this but it's at quietmindastrology.com slash free birth chart is the link to that where you can get your free birth chart and this is not on my end this is this this main like host that hosts all these like free charts online so a lot of the charts online are not working right now unfortunately mm -hmm. not just my site uh, but hopefully that'll be working soon but that's the link you can go to get that quietmindastrology.com slash free birth chart and otherwise you can just listen and learn today this will be shared on the facebook group right people can watch it later yeah absolutely. okay so then you can go back once you know what's going on in your chart you can use what i'm sharing here uh, yeah. to interpret things amazing i've just added the link to the comments so if you don't have it your web website is online it is working so people can download it <laughs> the website works just not that uh that part uh the chart calculator it'll say you need to validate your oh, location okay I see yeah. okay well this is for later then try this maybe okay. tomorrow or sometime next week yeah all right i'll leave it up to you take us awesome. through it all right cool uh, so I just want to share my screen here and you can see that. Yeah, Annie? We can, okay. yeah. So that's what we're here to do is find your authentic voice with Vedic astrology, this ancient teaching, uh, totally linked in with yoga and these yoga traditions that so many of you know here today. And that's the link again, quietmindastrology.com slash free birth chart which hopefully will be working soon. And uh, I do have a free workshop. If you want to go deeper in astrology, you can go to this link, quietmanastrology.com slash seven steps. So that's a free workshop I just did the other day about how to become your own astrologer. So if this is piquing your interest, that's where you go next. So I talked a little bit about me in 19 years of experience. I host three podcasts, uh, the Quiet Mind Yoga podcast, Yoga Teacher Training, and the Quiet Mind Astrology podcast with weekly horoscopes. I uh, average around 12,000 plus downloads a week. So really grateful for that. And uh, those of you who are watching, you might be teaching online or interested in doing podcasts. It's a great platform to reach people and share what you have to share. And I do have the Vedic Astrology Mentorship that happens to be open right now. It only opens one time a year, but it happened to coincide with this. So that enrollment is open right now if you are really wanting to go very deep in astrology. But today we're going to start with these essentials of looking at your birth chart so when you get your free birth chart, you see something that looks like this without these colors and these words, but it has your planets in it and your signs are there too. And we're going to look at a lot of this area of the chart is called your second house. And because when you look at the night sky, you divide it 360 degrees into 12 sections, you get 30 degree sections of the sky. And uh, the first house is that first 30 degrees of the sky on the eastern horizon. Second house is the next 30 degrees of the sky. 
And it's associated with these certain areas of your life. So if you look at what's happening in the second house, you can understand things like your voice. In particular is what we're going to focus on today. But you see it also represents other things too. And that's the biggest indicator of somebody's voice. Like somebody who has a Venus in the second house. I'm going to you know go into all these, but just a quick example. Venus, the planet in the second house, if it's well-placed, like if it's in the sign of Taurus or Libra, and then there are other places where it's more positive, places where it's not as great. Uh, not going to go so far into that today because it's a little more complicated, but just having Venus there at all is very likely to make somebody want to be a singer and very beautiful voice. Mm -hmm. Venus represents beauty and luxury and nice things, love, arts, uh, nature. So there's this like naturally beautiful voice that comes out that can express a lot. And it's very common that people who have Venus in second house are singing at a young age. I have a friend who just had a child a few years ago and every every other day he's posting a video of her singing something. She has Venus in the second house and she just loves to sing. And her Venus is actually not in its best placement and Virgo is not the best place for it to be, but she still loves to sing and she's still a great singer. So that's an example. Another quick example, I have K2 myself in the second house and in my childhood, I was very quiet and shy and almost too soft-spoken, like people couldn't hear me. K2 represents sort of detachment and separation from the voice, from the second house. Uh, so we'll go into this a little bit more, but just giving you some quick examples of the kind of things we're looking at is you take a planetary energy, you put it into the second house of your voice, and you get an effect, and it's very reliable. Like you can look at multiple charts and you'll see these similar themes. And there are other factors. There's lots more beyond that. This is a very simplification of it, but it often works pretty well enough that I'm going to share this. And like, hopefully you can see some value of like finding what some of your strengths of your voice are and some of your challenges are. This making sense, Annie? Absolutely, yes. I'm going to double check with comments coming in. So people, if Great. you have questions about this, um, please write them down. It's, ideal, it's because astrology got magazines, if that's a word. <laughs> well, Jeremy <laughs> talk about Vedic chart significations of teaching. Uh, say the question again. Will you talk about Vedic chart significations of teaching? I oh, teaching. Yes, we will as well. So we're going to go into the ninth house a little bit too. Um, that's like teachers and teachings and your 10th house is your career, some of your skills. So we will get into that a bit as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll start here with the second house and we'll have time for other questions too. It's a great question. Yeah. And someone else is saying, I have Taurus, Venus in second house. People say my voice is so soft and calming. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the best things you can have in the second house, uh, assuming there's no other negative influences and all that. But yeah, that is uh, a beautiful thing to have. Amazing. All right. So okay. everyone, if you have questions, write them down and throughout the chat, whenever time is right or whenever we see it aligns, we'll come back to it. All right, so what I'm sharing here is something that I share in my mentorship program. It's a spreadsheet that, like Annie said, I like to be very organized and detailed about everything. And this is every possible combination you can have is all in one place. So I give this to my teacher, trainee students for mentorship of astrology. But I'm going to share it with you here and show you examples of each planet in the second house. And we'll talk about the ninth and tenth house as well. Uh, ninth house, so again, as I mentioned, are your teachers, your higher education, your spiritual philosophy, and then your 10th house is your career and using your, how you show up in your career. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a little bit more on the pop astrology kind of side of things, because this is an oversimplification. We got to look at your whole chart holistically to really understand how everything interacts, but this is one piece of the puzzle. And if something doesn't resonate, you might have something canceling it out. If it does resonate, you probably have things reinforcing it. I always tell people, you want to look for three or more things to validate something in a chart. If you don't have that, it's not as strong. If you do have that, it's very likely that thing is true. 
So that's why you need to look at the whole chart, uh, but we're just gonna look at one piece. So hopefully this is helpful for everyone here today. Now, sun in the second house, so we're gonna go sun through K2, and uh, that's all the, the luminaries of the sky. Uh, real quick, Rahu is the north node of the moon, K2 is the south node of the moon. So it's not a real planet, but it's a, a point of the eclipses. All right, so starting with the sun in the second house, so there's some parts here about the other things to do with the second house. I'm not going to go into those too much. I'm going to focus more on the speech and the voice. So your, the sun in general is like the center of the solar system. It represents where you feel strong, confident, powerful, leadership, creativity, ability. In the second house, all that stuff would apply to your voice. So you'd have a strong voice, strong speech. It even says like regal speech as like a royal kind of uh, people who have like this, maybe like a, a really high falutin kind of accent <laughs> or like it sounds like uh, like a king and queen kind of uh, speech to their voice sometimes. Uh, really good with languages, somebody who is good at speaking multiple languages, which Annie teaches so much about. So uh, some a lot of people here might have this because you're all here about learning about languages. And that's the positive side of things. And uh, there could be good at speech to do with working in government. Like you could potentially teach yoga in a government position or to government people, employees, or be some sort of authority figure with your speech, which is what a lot of yoga teachers are, of course. Mm -hmm. And with your communication there can be issues of exaggeration and grandiosity of boasting too much being too prideful uh arrogance because the sun is the center of the solar system everything revolves around me kind of energy that can come out through your speech and your voice with the sun being here uh, it can be anger and pitta issues as well uh, the fire energy can be really strong and be fiery in the communication so that's the sun in second house. If you have the moon in the second house, very different energy. This is like the yin to the yang of the sun. Mm -hmm. And the moon represents where we're more nurturing, more comforting. It's more of a soothing, gentle kind of energy. And uh, like sweet speech, like you can be a sweet speaker, gently persuasive in your communication. So teaching things like yin, restorative, gentle meditation, uh, this kind of energy comes across really smooth and nurturing and caring versus the sun is like stronger kind of energy for vinyasa or hatha yoga or uh, more powerful kind of yoga practices. There's an imaginative quality with the moon in the second house. So you can use more imagery or metaphor like some teachers like me, I don't use a lot of metaphor imagery in my teaching, more literal. And some other teachers are very more, much more metaphorical. And I know, Annie, you talk about that in your teachings about you know, how you can use metaphors in your teaching and things like that. And then on the negative side, so we all have positive and negative things we're working with that we want to be mindful of. There could be an issue of not speaking up for yourself because the moon is always waxing and waning. If we just watch it in the sky, tomorrow it changes. The next day it changes. It's always changing and quickly. So there can be this part of yourself in your speech where you're not sort of standing up for yourself and you're very adaptable and somebody doesn't like this, so you change right away. And you don't have as much of the sense of like, who am I? Because I'm always changing. So what do I really stand for? Or how do I speak up for myself? And uh, some of these other things, while I'm sharing this, you might read through and resonate with you with other issues. Uh, but things like not applying yourself as consistently towards like gaining wealth, but as consistently towards your communication. And, and there could be some miscommunications or misunderstandings through that kind of thing. And again, everybody has positive, negative things. We all have these. There's no uh, blame or problem or fatalism to it. Um, some people can sometimes lean on their astrology like, well, I just have displacement, <laughs> so <laughs> that's just who I am. But we always have free will, or at least the illusion of free will. So we will always be responsible for, yes, this is you know where the stars were when I was born, and I have awareness and choice 
Yeah. And we always learn that in yoga practice and meditation to, to not be reactive, to have a choice and, and be aware of ourselves. We choose how to respond to everything. Mm -hmm. Mercury also very fast moving. If you just watch Mercury, which is very difficult to do because it's right by the sun. So it's usually not visible, but it's very fast moving. And uh, it's also this ability to uh, change and to be very dynamic. And Mercury represents communication in general. And wherever you have Mercury in your chart is going to be a factor of your voice. So you could we can do a whole section just on Mercury in any place that could be, in any aspect that could have, because it's so important to your voice. But in the second house is a generally positive place for it to be. Very clever in your communication. Somebody you might bring in more humor and wit and jokes and charm. And that sort of energy of like, that person is just a charming teacher. Like, I like to talk to them. I, they, I feel like they, they get me. And there's a pleasantness to the speech. There's a diplomatic kind of energy. So you need to like navigate like behind the scenes of a studio or business negotiations or things where there's like lots of different interests involved, you can manage that really well. You can say the right thing to the right person at the right time. There's a youthfulness to Mercury here as well, uh, to, to your appearance, but also to your voice. You might have a more youthful voice, like less of like a uh, mature adult kind of voice. Maybe even liking to talk about more like, childish things sometimes like in a playful way and just good with uh anything to do with communication really this is a very positive place to be now there can be some difficulty with focus and being too chatty in too many different directions even gossiping like too much uh different communication things going on like talking to this person that person being unreliable and um saying you're going to do something but not actually being able to back it up with your action because you can talk so much and there can be a long stage in the adolescent stage of life of like not wanting to grow up uh, arrested development kind of thing and there could be uh, speech issues here uh, it's going to depend if there's negative aspects on it so uh, but more of the other ones are more uh, generally applicable to everyone. Venus, now I mentioned this already, but Venus is beauty, arts, and love, nature, and desire. So there is like this desire to communicate, desire to express your voice. And great for singers, poets, musicians, great with language skills, because there's a love of language and a curiosity about language. And I want to pause to just say that if you have nothing in your second house, I should have said this earlier, if there's no planets in your second house, there are still aspects from other planets. And you want to look to what planet is ruling the second house. And it's very similar to if that planet were there. So let's say if you have the number seven in your second house, that's that means you have Libra, the sign Libra there, but no planet. Well, you still have a strong Venus energy in your second house because Venus rules Libra. So you would look where Venus is in your chart and that has some other color to it, some other influence of that place that Venus is in, but that is like Venus is in your second house. So that's an important thing to, I should have mentioned sooner, but uh, Venus being here is, is like pleasant to listen to just good communication, good manners. Like you say sweet things. It's pleasant to hear somebody with Venus and second house talk. And then the negative side, um, there, they could be like, it doesn't say this here, but they could be like too sweet in their voice. Like you might be afraid to hurt somebody's feelings or afraid to say the wrong thing. So you kind of sugarcoat things or you're just too nice or too sweet and people can feel like it's not authentic at times. Uh, so it can be inauthentic in like being too sweet, which in a way is authentic to you because 
it's your Venus uh, being out of balance. But uh, so you want to watch for that of like making sure your communication is is coming from what you really want to say and not um, just trying to be sweet and nice. Any comments coming in, Annie? No, I don't think so. No, no more questions, no more comments. I think it's all very clear. If you do have them, people, write them down. I see that you're watching. So I'm, yeah. I'm guessing that you have questions. In the meantime, I'm taking notes because <laughs> <laughs> really interested. Yes, no, no questions, but I will let you know if they are, if there are. Great, thank you. Yeah, feel free if you have questions or if you have any of these placements, let me know. We'll talk about it. Uh, okay, so Mars now, quite a different energy. This is more of a yang kind of energy as well. Mars, the red planet associated with war, action, drive, ambition. And we can already, if you've, you've been following this far, you can probably start to pick up, okay, we take that kind of energy, a warrior, you put it in the second house of your voice, what kind of expression might you expect? And I want to see uh, if anyone wants to type in the comments, what kind of communication might you expect from somebody with Mars in the second house based on what you've learned so far? And my hope is that you're seeing how easy it can be to start to put these things together. Let's see. When I think of my, I always think of, but I think it's because of the apps that I'm using, but it's more like aggression, like fiery, um, what elements or ways yeah. of speaking, being, yeah, we not being aggressive, but really fierce in the way that you communicate. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So like direct to the point, like, okay, let's do something here. Uh, somebody wants to make a point and make a statement and like active speaker, uh, there is like a, a cheerleader, right? It's like you're yelling. It's very, very like, so, like, let's go, let's do this kind of thing. Motivational. <laughs> yeah, motivational, exactly. Uh, military, it's very like military, like do this, do that, step by step. And uh, it can be just sort of blunt and direct. So on the negative side, harsh speech, of course, this one's kind of easy to kind of put together to it can be anger issues, bluntness, uh, snoring. Yeah, that's another one. It's like it's like overactive in, during your sleep and your expression mm -hmm. and talking too much, talking too fast. That's also a concern for Mercury to talking too fast. Mm -hmm. I've got yeah. a question here. My moon, yeah. Mercury, and Venus are all in the second house in Taurus. Would it mean Venus is kind of more dominant and affecting the others because, because it is a dispos dispositor of Taurus? That's Yeah, so what dispositor means is if Venus rules Taurus. Uh, so if you, oh, what is ruling over this house of second house? It's Venus. So that's the dispositor. Uh, it's a term we use in astrology, but uh, yeah, so that would be more dominant because if you're looking, okay, we got three planets together, who's in charge here? <laughs> who's ruling all this? That's Venus uh, because that's the dispositor. So everything is going to defer to that Venus kind of energy. But overall, that is quite positive. Moon and Taurus is one of the best things you can have in a chart too. That's very beautiful communication. Uh, and just... And for everything, Moon and Taurus is very positive. And then Mercury there is great as well. So yeah, that's very positive. And you would, to a degree, interpret all three. And then you filter it all through the Venus stuff. Uh, so it, I'm trying to keep it simple here. But yeah, it can get a little complicated with that. But that's the simple version. Mm -hmm. All right. So let us know if the answer is clear. Ajara yeah. is asking how we can have basic information about Astro uh, astrology and I think listen to your podcast right <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the best and there's tons of episodes there I actually just made a new site for the podcast it's free and you can search through any word in any episode it's a cool platform so if I ever said anything about Venus 
in the second house you can just search that and you'll go right to that episode in that section yes i love this new feature i'm going to copy it to the chat so you can find it cool the comments um there we go that's the podcast all Thank right you. cool so uh jupiter now and and we just observe the planets we look at what they are jupiter is called a gas giant it's massive of course and it's the biggest planet besides the sun uh, the sun is not a planet of course it's a star but uh, jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system so it represents big things expansion abundance growth philosophy the meaning of life so if this is in your second house you're going to want to talk about all of these things you're going to want to talk about affirmations and abundance and prosperity and growth and possibility and be very positive and very much uh inspiring inspirational wanting to bring like quotes into your expression and different aspects of philosophy there and just checking through notes humor yeah humor is a big part too so there's often like this sense of laughter from and around people with Jupiter in second house mm -hmm. as a generosity as well. Very giving, very benefic, positive energy overall. And some of the negative side is you can be overextending, overgiving, overspending, especially on like charity time like staying long after classes to talk to somebody because you want to give more you want to be generous and uh, there can be periods of uh, inactivity or laziness that can come with this as well it's a kind of different topic uh, just about speech though uh, they're too grand it can be grandiosity with this one too it's not here in the notes but like you could uh, just be too big and broad with your speech as well where you're not helping people get the more minute details like you might have a sense of like the sequence of a class and the theme of the class but you're forgetting you're losing students you're like what are we doing now or where are we in this pose or what's happening here because you forgot some of the details so you want to make sure you're also aware of that part too saturn Another very different from Jupiter energy in the second house. So Saturn is about restriction uh, because if we look through the cycles of time with Saturn. It tends to be associated with things like great restrictions, the Great Depression, uh, re challenges, limitations, financial recessions. It's around age 30, 60 and 90. We have our Saturn return which is often a bit of a identity crisis for people or a sort of maturation, uh, a maturing kind of process of like, all right, I, I need to grow up now. I'm in a new decade. I'm in a new uh, phase of life. And S Saturn brings us like difficult lessons where we need to learn these lessons to grow and mature. And if we don't, we just repeat them later on and then we get another chance. But that being in your second house of your voice, your communication is going to be a bit more serious to your communication, more methodical, uh, more orderly in your speech. Like people with strong Saturn energy in general like to be more by the book. OK, what are the rules? OK, we do A, B, C, D, and E, F, and G, and H, I, and J, K, L, and you know, every... <laughs> It's like I want to follow all of it and make sure I did it right and that could be really good for something like Iyengar yoga or something that's more anatomy and alignment based or even Bikram yoga which is a very exact script every time or Ashtanga yoga it's the same sequence every time uh, and if it's other styles it's just more about the gravity of the whole thing so people could come to you and feel the sense of gravity and like they can relax in your presence because there's a ground there. There's a it's an earthy kind of quality to this in your communication. Uh, generally more conservative in nature or wanting to keep things more like sustainable, not like politically conservative, but more like sustainable, wanting like simple, traditional, like traditional yoga methods. 
and wanting standard processes and practices. And uh, some of the <laughs> challenges are kind of obvious here. Like it can be kind of boring. <laughs> it can be kind of boring in your speech, like just too serious, too by the book. And it can be inconsiderate and people could feel like you're cold because well, I'm being factual. Why do I need to be emotional? There's no need for emotion. I'm, I'm telling you the thing, right? So it can seem a little cold and distant and uh, disconnected at times. And a bit harsh it can, it can be like dry in the communication, just like too harsh, too to the point. And some of these negative things are a little more intense. Don't, <laughs> don't worry about those. <laughs> Paralysis of the mouth, like that, that's, there's a lot more to that kind of stuff, like the uh, medical astrology that I'm not getting into here. So don't get worried about that. <laughs> and now Rahu and K2. So the Rahu is the north node of the moon. K2 is the south node of the moon. Rahu is depicted as a head of a sort of demon kind of figure without a body. And then K2 is a body without a head. So they go together. And Rahu, you can imagine this head that comes through every eclipse season and it swallows the sun. And if you actually watch the eclipses, you look at the video of an eclipse, it looks like the sun is being swallowed, right? or the uh, this kind of energy if it's like passing through. But also in the same way, the sun comes right out the other side immediately, just like a head without a body, like it's not digested. So I'm saying all that because it's like a metaphor for understanding what Rahu represents for us. It's just something we observe in the sky. But it's actually very true that where you have Rahu, there's this insatiable quality where you want to take in things or consume things or uh, want more and it just kind of passes through and you're not really having a body to feel satisfied of like get that sort of uh, hormonal signal that you're full <laughs> so your stomach saying okay i've had enough but in your head it's like insatiable and there's a lot of rahu energy in general in the world in the past several years because of the technology we have it's like you can uh, scroll through social media and then you're not done and you want more and you want more and there's more and there's just infinite, endless amount of information and experiences now. So we all need to kind of be really aware of that part of ourselves that can get uh, really hooked on things and not conscious of like, okay, I've had enough and set boundaries with ourselves. So Rahu in the second house, uh, that was a little bit of a sidebar, just what Rahu is, but being in the second house in our speech uh, it can show that we don't know when we've had enough to to talk, to talk about, <laughs> to speak. Uh, but it's generally not as problematic here as I just made it sound. Uh, it will bring that into more play in the other two parts we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. One of the other things Rahu represents is foreign things in general. So things that are outside of your traditional experience of what's normal for you because the eclipses only happen a couple times a year. So it's not like the everyday normal kind of thing when Rahu swallows the sun. So it can represent interest in foreign languages and benefiting from foreign languages. It can represent unusual speaking abilities because you're interested in so many different things that you pick up these unusual ways of speaking, maybe an unusual accent. And you can have unusual uh, facial decorations, like piercings or different ways of doing makeup, things like that as well. Uh, other speech specific things. I think that's all I wanted to say on that. There's a cleverness to like a crafty ability with Rahu. Of, like you're going to get the result you want because it's this, it can be addictive energy of like, I'm, I need to do this. And you'll figure out a way to use your voice to help you get that thing. It can be devious and deceptive in your speech. Uh, it can be a lot of complaining because of this unfulfilled kind of energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, losses through that deception as well. Speaking negatively of others, because it's like, while they're here, I'll say this. And then while they're gone, I'll say that. Because it's that quickly sort of passing through 
a very quick kind of thing to Rahu. And other medical stuff, I won't get into that, but there can be uh, wanting to take in substances. Uh, Rahu is this like obsessive addictive quality in us. We all have it somewhere that in the second house, it could be that you could become obsessed with food, with drugs, alcohol, smoking, some sort of thing coming, passing through the mouth, food, alcohol, drugs, sexual addictions. This could all be Rahu in second house too on the negative side. And addiction is a whole other topic, way deeper than today. But uh, being aware, having awareness is always the first step of working with any of these challenges, just being aware that something is happening there. K2 in the second house, I have this in my chart. And that is the opposite kind of energy in some ways, because it's the south node of the moon. It's opposite of Rahu, always in a chart. Uh, so if you have K2 in second house, that means you have Rahu in the eighth house. They always go together like this. And K2 is that body without a head. So if you just imagine going through your life without using your head, what you would do, like if you've ever been blindfolded, like in some sort of experiment or something, just to like exercise and move around your, your space, you can sense how much like you have to tune into your senses and you have to really feel the world more. Mm -hmm. And you can't think about it as much. You can't, you know, so much of our brain is visual. So you take that away. So K2 there uh, gives us more of this sort of sensing and feeling in our expression and communication. And uh, this gives us an unusual ability with languages, like an exceptional or unusual way of speaking, because we we feel in, in a different way. We're not um, like using we're using communication to help us understand and feel our way to how we express ourselves. But it's detached as well. So there can be like, especially in early childhood, like I had as well, it's very shy, very quiet, very reserved. Uh, very sort of uncomfortable with my voice in a way, like afraid to use it. <laughs> and then funny enough, like a lot of these things happen where if you have something like this, like K2 specifically represents your past life. So like in a past life, uh, you would have already done that thing. Like in the past life, I was probably an excellent speaker and it's all about my communication, all about wealth and family and the second house stuff. And I come into this lifetime like, okay, I've done that in the past. That's what K2 represents, your past life. And now I want to explore something different in Rahu. So Rahu is kind of what you're driven to in this life. So like if you have Rahu in the eighth house, like I do, I'm very driven towards like occult studies, yoga, astrology, transformational work. Uh, but that shows like with K2 there, you can have a remarkable speaking quality or ability like very good at speech once you kind of get in the hang of it again <laughs> and now i have three podcasts and i use my voice every day is my is my work oh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny like in high school i was in bands and we would never be able to find a singer and i would be like well i guess i'll do it so i ended up having to sing all the time <laughs> even though like i didn't want to use my voice i was like shy and people would be like, oh, wow, you're actually pretty good. Uh, so, so it's this kind of funny thing with K2 in the second house. And I was very self-conscious of my voice and all that. But I've actually gotten so much positive feedback on my voice, especially in my yoga classes. Like, I'd always get a lot of positive feedback on it. And that really motivated me to keep doing it. Uh, but also very spiritual speech. So I love to talk about the spiritual stuff like we're doing here. And uh, negative side uh, can be unsophisticated in the speech, like especially earlier in life, just like not able to express myself. And there are some issues I still have of like more in my, my relationship where it's like I'm not communicating in the way that I think I am or want to be communicating. So that can that can happen sometimes where you feel like it's not coming across quite the way you wanted it to. Uh, but it also on the positive of that is like it helps you simplify things. So as a teacher, it's a good skill to have. 
and can be deceptive and not clear and direct in your communication. And I can talk about all these bad things because I have it. So <laughs> of like in not being overt and direct and to the point and not saying what you really mean sometimes. Definitely had to work on that in my life. And a lot of these, you know, family issues I definitely had. Doesn't eat healthfully. That's never been an issue. I've I have other things. I totally canceled that out in my chart. Uh, so the food and stuff. Also the second house. Uh, but I have had a ton of teeth issues, but that's more than medical astrology. So that's all for that. And I won't go into Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Those are factors and I do use them, but it's more generational and less personal. So I'm going to leave that out. And I'm going to pause there. And then we're going to talk a little quicker about the ninth and 10th house for the last 10 minutes or so here. Any questions, comments? No, I don't see any questions. Yeah, people, I think they're just really interested in listening because they're still all watching. So everyone, if you've got questions or comments in general, things that you would like to share, feel free to do so. That's what we're here for today. Yeah. I'm super intrigued, like always. I And I find it really funny that you explain these things about yourself because your voice is what got me hooked to the, to the podcast. And I think I listened to it for a long time, even before like going further and searching for you on, on social media, because you've got such a pleasant voice, a really nice voice to listen to. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's amazing that maybe from childhood on, I would say, um, or you would not be so outgoing with it. But now, like owning three podcasts, it's incredible. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I will not hold you up longer. <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Uh, so ninth house is a big factor in your spiritual expression, your higher education, your beliefs, your philosophies. So this also represents your teachers and then to a degree, how you become a teacher. And I'm going to go a little quicker through these, but uh, like the sun in the ninth house is generally just very positive. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And uh, it can be very good at leading in education, leading and teaching, being a teacher, very good place to have that. You don't have to have these, and I talk about these positive things. You don't have to have these to be you know, have positive things. There's so many other factors, but if you happen to have them, great. Uh, moon in the 10th house tends to bring like a very uh, fortunate experience with a teacher. This is a very positive thing as well. Ninth house in general is very positive overall, uh, but it's like wanting to have a spiritual philosophy that really stimulates you mentally and very much interests you. And one that has in it a sort of compassion and nurturing, like Jack Canfield, Cornfield, Jack Cornfield talks about a path with heart. Like that's a kind of moon in ten, moon in ninth house kind of energy. Mercury here, uh, more dynamic, wanting more of a interesting, dynamic kind of experience with philosophy, more taking on different ideas, different perspectives. And you're teaching, wanting to teach a lot of different topics. Like, I just learned this and I teach about that. And that connects to this. Uh, so there's a very like quick-minded, uh, charming kind of energy too. Venus here is a love of philosophy, a love of higher education, a desire to get like letters behind your name and further certifications and uh, just very positive, uh, loving kind of energy that comes through your teaching and how you want to teach. Mars, more direct, action-oriented, like wanting to teach like fitness in yoga, health and wellness in yoga. You're concerned with like, how does this affect you physically and what is the result and the outcome of doing this practice versus uh, like some of the other placements, like the moon is less outcome oriented or K2 less outcome oriented about your um, teaching and working with teachers. Jupiter, one of the best placements of anything you can have in a whole chart, Jupiter in the ninth house, very, very positive. Like you have amazing teachers, you'll be an amazing teacher. 
uh, you'll want to study philosophy and really go deep into philosophy. It's very expansive growth through your spiritual path, through your life. Uh, everything to do with education, philosophy, teaching, it's, uh, very, very positive. Saturn here is more of this desire to be of service in your teaching. Like you might want to teach underserved populations, teach some sort of like free online classes, doing things that are more equitable, uh, being more organized in your teaching, more structured and systematic in your teaching approach. And this, everything I'm saying with the ninth house applies to you as a teacher and the kind of teachers you're going to thrive with and resonate with. Uh, so many other factors I want to touch on, but I'm not <laughs> going to, but that is the simplification of it. And then Rahu in the ninth house, that desire for, uh, insatiable desire for a teacher. So you might end up having one teacher and then another and another, and there's this sense of like, you're not quite getting what you're looking for, because that's what Rahu is always going to give you. It's like, there's always more, uh, but at the same time, it can make you want uh, have this strong desire and passion for really learning more philosophy more spirituality getting more certifications and as a teacher you always have this drive so the positive thing about rahu is like this infinite energy there wherever that is in your chart it's like you could do that all day every day you don't have to try you don't have to like get up the confidence or courage to do it it just happens so you can utilize that wherever rahu is especially in the ninth house like you're just naturally going to be learning all the time and wanting to be teaching and wanting to be working with teachers mm -hmm. uh, k2 it's like again past life you did that had a guru was a guru who did all the teaching all the higher education so you've got that in your back pocket and you come into this lifetime more interested in the rahu stuff which is opposite the ninth house and third house. Uh, but you still have that and you're very likely going to have great spiritual teachers and, and want to teach more about like non-attachment, non-grasping, aparigraha, and wanting to explore lots of different philosophies and be more of like a spiritual seeker and less attached to any particular modality. So that's the quick look at the ninth house, which is a big part of what we do as teachers of like, what is your philosophy? What is your teaching method? How are you expressing your teaching? And uh, quick look at the planets through. I showed the uh, little blurb so you could also read about it yourself if you want, because uh, there's other things I didn't cover in there. And I know I'm covering a lot, but last few minutes, we're going to go into 10th house. Uh, I like to make sure you get a ton of value out of everything I share. So 10th house is your career, your, your purpose. And it's also your workplace environment. It's where people see you, your fame, uh, your recognition. And the sun in the 10th house is one of those extremely positive things to have in a chart. It's very well placed there. So somebody like politicians have this, uh, which you might not want to be a politician or think that's not very <laughs> positive, uh, but uh, they have a high level of fame and recognition, right? And they have a high level of power and influence, uh, supposedly. Uh, but the sun there is like, wherever your career is, it's like you're very much in the spotlight. You're very visible. You're very powerful, very influential. And... If you have this, uh, it's likely to lead to like success, fame, fortune, uh, recognition. And there, there often is a desire to work in government positions with this because 10th house is government uh, and sun is like the leader. So it's quite common that people have that. Uh, but it could be that you're working in corporate environments, you're teaching corporate classes. Uh, and if you don't have the fame and success, there could be other things canceling that out. Uh, but it does show that like people see you, they recognize you like, oh, wow, that, like she really stands out as a teacher. And like, it's, it's a very positive placement. Moon in the 10th house. This is one I have as well. And um, it's a desire, like 10th house career, 
uh, the moon is always changeable. So like my career has constantly been evolving and changing and the moon represents more yin feminine energy. And I've always worked with predominantly women and I haven't tried to do that. It just ends up happening. And I uh, usually end up like all my teacher trainings. I'm usually one of the only guys there. In my yoga classes, I'm usually one of the only guys there. And I never really think about it, but it is a, a true thing. Uh, so moon in 10th house tends to be like working with women, career with women's health, women's issues, things like that. Counseling, teaching. Uh, it's about your emotional support in your career. So it's very important that you have emotional support yourself in your career, but you are likely to be uh, some sort of emotional support for other people, nurturing for other people. Mercury here in the 10th house. It's usually close to the sun, so it's common you'd have the sun here too. You might not, but uh, Mercury here is your communication. It's your mind. In Sanskrit, it's buddhi. Some of you might know the buddhi mudra, your thumb and pinky. Uh, so that's Mercury is buddhi is your intellect, your intelligence. So you want to use your intelligence in your career. You want to be quick-witted, charming, clever, smart, cunning. If you're not getting to use your work, your intelligence, your mind, and, and really that sort of quick thinking in your career, you're not going to be as satisfied if it's more like a monotonous, mundane job. So you want to be able to use that quick thinking and put yourself in situations where you've got to think quickly. Venus in the 10th house of wanting to bring more love and uh, the sort of heart-centered kind of energy into your work and this love of like beauty and aesthetics. So you might want to teach a style or in a way that emphasizes heart opening, the beautiful symmetry and alignment of the shapes, uh, more of the heart-centered like compassion kind of work, forgiveness kind of work, emotional kind of work. Uh, true with the moon to a degree as well, but more so Venus. And uh, it can be very inspiring to other people. And also working with females more off, more likely than males with Venus in the 10th house. Also wanting to make people feel comfortable is a big part of that. Like if you like opened a yoga studio, it would just feel amazing. There. It'd be so beautiful and comforting and nurturing and like this natural elements. Uh, so you want your workplace to have stuff like that too, or you're not going to be as fulfilled there. Mars, of course, more like a career work in like a gym environment or an athletic environment or military. Uh, also could be IT, which is very technical and precise, or uh, like surgeons. Have, this could be like Mars in the 10th house. You want to be very precise and analytical and like direct. And, but also, you know, gyms, fitness centers, health clubs, places that are more focused on athletics and goal out, goal oriented outcomes with uh, your work rather than the other kinds of outcome, like more open ended stuff. Jupiter in 10th house, quite positive. Uh, it's a lot of expansion and growth in your career, wanting to be a teacher, very favorable for being a teacher, a guru to others, a teacher to others and uh, helping others in consulting, planning, uh, being in some role of like teaching and sharing information, sharing philosophy, spirituality with others. Likely have a very good reputation. Uh, people just think very positively of Jupiter and 10th house. Uh, Saturn and 10th house. This is a very uh, synonymous kind of energy. Saturn rules uh, the 10th sign of Capricorn. So this similar kind of energy and it's very uh, much a devotion to service in your work a uh, desire for like a structured work environment a steady methodical approach to work like this is common for people who end up finding a job after high school and they stay there for 30 years 40 years they retire end of story right very simple straightforward just like check the boxes do the thing and that, that's a part of their life that's just like orderly and and set uh, and there's a desire for service there. And there is like steady growth through that because they stay there and they build like tenure and seniority and responsibility because they have that um, commitment and that patience to stay with something for a long time. Uh, good benefits in working with in foreign countries, like teaching in foreign countries, things like that. 
Uh, so if you want to teach yoga for the rest of your life, you have Saturn here. It's very doable. <laughs> And interest in old things as well, like old career paths. Yoga, of course, is very old thing. Uh, Ayurveda, all the, like Vedic teachings are very old. So your career is centered around that is going to be very helpful and important to you. And uh, Rahu, uh, and your work being unusual, foreign in some way, like maybe teaching foreign students, teaching a different language to foreign students, or teaching in a different language. And uh, having a career where you just have this passion, desire for it. And th it can be this issue of like one career to the next and you're not quite satisfied. Uh, but overall, it, it does have this drive of like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to find my career path. I'm going to be really driven towards that. And you could do well to work in distant lands and remote foreign places. Like yoga retreats, ashrams, things like that. And K2 in the 10th house, again, it's like you've been there in the past life. It's all about career, last lifetime. Now you're more interested in your home life. Uh, people with K2 here tend to do well to work from home. Uh, but in your career, like this, this one is hard for people. Like you might feel like, I, I just, I wish I could just stay at home and get paid <laughs> and not do anything. I don't want to have to worry about like work and career and figuring out my purpose and I just want to focus on like my family, home or other things. So people struggle with this. I've done quite a few readings with people who have K2 and 10th house who are like not sure about what career direction to go. And spirituality in your career helps a lot because that is K2. A sense of detachment from your work is helpful. Like where you're not identified with it, you don't go around like, I am a this, I am a that. It's not as much like tied in with who you are. You have your own life outside of it. And uh, you can do very well in spiritual kind of works, like developing higher states of consciousness, teaching meditation, teaching retreats, helping other people sort of detach from their lives and let go of their attachments and grasping to life. So teaching yoga and meditation and non-attachment kind of practices in your career is awesome with this. But if you're like in a corporate ladder kind of job and you feel like you have to hit all these goals, that's going to feel very demotivating and unsatisfying. So finding a way to bring in the spiritual is very important with this. And that's all. I went a little bit over time, sorry. That's all right. That's all right. I'm going to, I've got some questions here for you. Yep. For yes. those who haven't written them down yet, please do. Please do. This is your chance, really. Um, could you please repeat the the meaning of what is what does this, the second, the ninth and the tenth house really stand for? Yes. The second house is your voice. I'll show you the screen, actually. Uh Short version, second house, voice, family, wealth, it's the ninth house, like father, religion, long travel as well, uh, your higher education, uh, like getting letters behind your name. And the 10th house is like your career, fame, reputation, uh, government things. And okay, yeah, I got screen share. So the second house oops, is this one. And the ninth house is this one, the tenth house is this one. Right. And those are the big ones we looked at today. Everything else is a factor and it all matters, but just to really keep it simple today, we looked at those three. Yeah. I think that that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that does clarify the times. It, it's so interesting. I'm so interested. I'm really excited about everything. Um, I do was asking, I've got no planets in my ninth house, but the ruling planet in Jupiter placed in the eighth house. So I listened to Jupiter and Mars, the ruler of my eighth house, but I remember reading that when a planet goes into the 12th house from itself, it's a loss of the planets are going overseas for it. What that would it be the right? She yes. says right comments, but is this right what she's saying? <laughs> Uh, to a degree, yes. Uh, in this case, it's it's kind of an interesting one. So I actually have a similar thing. It's funny that you're here asking that. Uh, so I have. So what you have there is the ruler of the ninth is in the eighth house. 
-hmm. And I have that too in my chart. And I thought early on when I was learning astrology, I thought that meant that I couldn't be a teacher. So I asked my yoga teacher, I was like, well, this is like, wouldn't this mean a loss of teaching or a loss of teachers? And to a degree, there is a level of that, but it's, it's, this is where it gets more nuanced and subtle because yes, the 12th away from it is the loss of that thing in general, but in this circumstance, being in the eighth house, it is more of like, not about the loss of the thing, but like the spiritualization of the thing. So mm -hmm. it's about taking that thing, the teaching and making it far more spiritual and about transformation because it's the eighth house and the eighth house and being the 12th is like this similar compatible energy of like, okay, you take loss and you take lessons from it. And like, I've had a lot of losses in my life that I feel are like the most important and positive things that happened to me. Uh, and I have lost teachers and I have lost ma major things in my life, but they've been some of the most positive things, especially for you, because you have Jupiter that in this in this whole thing, because uh, Jupiter is that ruling of the ninth house. Mm -hmm. So it's even more positive. And then Mars being there, it's like, as long as you're taking action about it and being proactive and using that loss to fuel your activity and, and what you do in the world, it can be extremely positive. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's like the really quick version. I hope that's helpful. There's other things I could say, but I just want to keep it succinct. Yeah, amazing. I hope that clarifies, uh, clarifies the question. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. I had a question awesome. earlier, just a regular thing, because obviously you know so much about this. And for example, when you know a lot about Ayurveda, you can kind of tell by the way that people speak to you, the way that they like look by, the, by well, their anatomy. What, what is their like dominant dosha, right? Can you also tell what kind of planets or houses are dominant in a person for you? That is an art. I'm not perfect <laughs> at yet. <laughs> I feel really good at the Ayurveda one. I, yeah. I could sense you're probably more Vata Pitta or Pitta Vata. Is that true? <laughs> vata Kapha. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, see so there. I guess I don't have that either. <laughs> uh, I just imagine Pitta because you're so proactive in your work and get so much done. I don't understand how that happens, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so you can do that. And there are people who are better at that than I am. That's not one of the things I'm great at. Uh, but there's whole branches where you could just look at somebody and say, okay, you have this and this and that. Uh, there's um, palmistry, you know, you can just, there's people who can just look at your palm and tell you your whole birth chart with good accuracy. Uh, but those are skills I have not mastered, but I'm really good at just looking at the chart and going from there. But that is something I would like to learn one day. So that's a, that is possible. Yeah, amazing. Really interesting. We've got a lot of thank yous here. So um, is there anything else that you would like to add or recommend uh, for people that are interested and want to learn more about this. Yeah, you can check out the free workshop that I just did the other day. It's at quietmindastrology.com slash seven steps. That's only going to be up for two more weeks. So if you want to check it out, that's up there. And then the podcast is up all the time, Quiet Mind Astrology Podcast. And that's the great resource to just keep in touch. Every week I do weekly horoscopes. And then I do extra episodes on like lessons and things you can apply. It's always focused on what does this mean for you? How do you apply this to your life? Because that's where it really matters. And that's what I wished existed 10, 15 years ago. So that's what I created it for myself first. So I can know what's going on every week and work with it. So I share it so you can do the same. So Quiet Mind Astrology podcast. And I really appreciate y'all being here. Thank you so much, Annie, for the opportunity to share with everyone. And it's been a real pleasure to be here. Yes, absolutely. I really enjoy that. I'm super grateful for you for sharing your knowledge. And this, I think it's so valuable to really understand who you are and how you can optimally use that knowledge in your teaching and your career. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I have to say is the last session oh. of the summit. Oh, yeah. 
So, <laughs> so <laughs> thanks everyone for joining the summit. I hope everything was useful. If you haven't been able to watch everything, you can watch all the interviews on the online learning platform. Everything will be there. All the recordings and all the replays will be there. And as usual, if you have any questions, send messages, post your questions or whatever it is in the Facebook group. We're here to support you. And I hope to see all of you very soon and stay connected. <laughs> Sending you all lots of love. <laughs> yeah. I'm grateful I got to be on the last one. I feel honored. Yes, amazing. We're closing together. <laughs> yeah. All right. See you all later, everyone.